Good morning. You're listening to WXOX 97.1 FM in Louisville, Kentucky, or perhaps WXND, uh, our sister station at 100.9 on the dial. This is Artist Talk with LVA, produced by Louisville Visual Art, and I'm the host, Keith Waits. So I've got two people here today who are exhibiting together in a show at Tim Faulkner Gallery. Margaret Archambault is an abstract painter and the gallery director at Tim Faulkner Gallery in Louisville. Uh, she paints uh, what she calls, uh, in, th in three forms, direct experience, or what she calls depictive abstraction, straight expressionism, or historical collage paintings. And we'll get her to talk about more about that in a minute. She's exhibited widely in Louisville and the surrounding area, and in 2021 exhibited as part of Purely Primary at the Vanderplas Gallery in New York City, New York State. Uh, Carter Brown is a Louisville-born abstract expressionist artist working in various mediums, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, and trying to, as he said, invite as many people in as possible. His work is positive and full of whimsy. Uh, he is a, has a studio space on East Market Street down there in what has become famous as the Nulu District. So uh, they are showing together right now in the February show at Tim Faulkner Gallery. It's due to open, uh, Margaret, it's Friday night or tomorrow? Yes, this Friday night, 6 p.m. Right, so fingers crossed that the ice apocalypse is not too horrible. Uh, they have an opening, but the work is going to be up and will be up all through February. So uh, plenty of opportunity, hopefully, for you to visit. So thanks for being with me here, you guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Margaret, let me just start with you for a second. So uh, this is not this is not a show with a particular theme or something. You as a gallery director, Tim Fox represents a bunch of different artists. And so this is a show that just highlights some of the artists that you work with. Right. It's just like it's the February show. Yeah, um, I mean, when we went into the February show, I really wanted it to be focused on uh, love and, you know, kindness and coming together and warmth and all those kinds of things that you would expect from February. And the artists who are exhibiting definitely have come through with that, that idea. Okay. Um, well, let me, so, so Carter, let's start with you. I want you to talk about um, how many pieces do you have in the show? Oh, let's see. Gosh, close to 20. Oh, we can't eat well, <laughs> well, he tell it. I guess, yeah, close to one. Did, did you leave yeah. room for the other artists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, and, uh, and I should point out, uh, we're doing this interview uh, online, we're recording the interview online, and Margaret and uh, Carter are actually in the gallery in Tim Faulkner gallery. So if you get a look at this on YouTube, you'll get a look at the show. Um, so talk to me about the work that you have up. What, what, what should people expect to see? What are you doing in the work that they'll find from you here? Well, uh, this month for February, I definitely, uh, I put a lot of attention into love, um, and emotion because I know, especially with, you know, the way the world has been lately you know for everyone in general as a society i feel like you know, we need more of that and that is the way out of a lot of a lot of our our problems so i wanted to put more color and more emotion into this one more light more you know when people come here it it, it takes them away from all that well now your work as, as we were getting ready for the interview, you talked about how, and Margaret did too, how positive the the, the emotion is and the energy is in your work. So uh, it seems like you were a natural person to invite in with that idea in Margaret's mind. But did you did you get a chance to create new work for this show, or 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 is this sort of where your work is in the in in the first place? Um, no, actually, yeah, I did get a chance to create new works uh, for this show. I think I'm always. I'm always in in some form trying to not not be as repetitive. Try to you know change and see and push the boundaries of what I can do. You know, and and I, I definitely got the chance to create new things for the show with with hands and and with other designs that I was playing around with colors. So is this is this a mix of two D and three D work from you? Mm -hmm. Yes. It is. Yeah. Okay. Do you? Uh, to work both two dimensionally, and, and when we talk about two dimensional, is that mostly painting? You're a painter, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. painting, and then a, a little drawing. 
well, painting and drawing, that's just like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, um, you're right, you're right. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, you know, uh, painters draw and uh, not everybody that draws paints, but painters draw, um, um, I think is a fair observation. Um, do you work in two dimensional and three dimensional work sort of uh, equally, or do you find yourself going through periods where you do a lot of painting and then periods where you want to work more with, uh, with shapes and space? I definitely go through periods. Um, I definitely do go through periods. I feel like where I, uh, I, I tend to completely envelop myself in my work. So when I do want to focus on one area, I kind of just completely drown myself in that area until I feel like I'm all right, I'm going to move on to the next or I, I feel like I need to. So, um, yeah, it definitely is a period periodical thing for me. Okay. Margaret, let's talk about your stuff for a minute here, um, or more than a minute. Um, <laughs> um, you're an abstract painter and you work pretty large. Um, is, is, is what I'll find in the gallery right now kind of typical of your work or how would you describe it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you had mentioned in the intro, the, I have kind of three buckets that I pull from as a painter. If I get really tired of uh, tedious, you know, mark making on a large canvas, creating these um, unusual characters that I'm always making, then I'll pull myself away and go over to the straight abstraction category in my mind and, and real free. And the work that's up this month, I just finished a new piece that would fall under that depictive ab abstraction in my mind uh, category. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a pretty good size piece, 58 inches by 40 inches. Uh, and it's oil and spray paint. It's titled Valentine's for Nikolai, Nikola, um, kind of a nod to Nikola Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's some, a few other new pieces as well. I've done a couple silk screen panels, which I love to paint on. The surface on those are so great. Uh, I had got a, a friend uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, just gave me a whole slew of these uh, vintage silkscreen panels. So every once in a while, I'll pull those out and just to play with a different surface. And so there's two new silk screens in this show, as well as uh, new paintings as well. So when uh, uh, talking about these three buckets, um, because you describe yourself as an abstract painter, but I can immediately think of examples of your work I've seen where there was a figurative element. Is that the depictive? Yes, 100%. Um, you know, when I was in school, and I'm sure a lot of other people, have, you know, went through this as well. You know, when you're painting abstractly or uh, uh, in an expressionist sort of way, the desire is, you know, destroy the image, destroy the image. Uh, and, and I had done that for many years. And then when the pandemic hit, especially, I really had a lot more time, like we all did. And I found myself saying, you know what? I don't want to destroy these images anymore. I'm over the destruction of the images. I want to pull these images and I want to develop them. They're still abstracted, but they're definitely not only expressionist, right? So they're depicting, in my mind, I'm always telling a story with a painting. I'm always trying to get the viewer to understand some idea that I've got stuck in my head that I think is really important to understand. And um, I use these crazy characters, if you will, to kind of relay that idea. I want them to understand some point. Uh, there's a piece hanging in the gallery right now called Zoom, 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 which kind of is apropos here. Um, but, you know, the whole thing was done with all these people are having nothing but Zoom contact for, you know, the entire beginning of 2020. And, you, you know, you saw all kinds of things you might not normally see in people's homes. You saw, you know, the cat run across the screen or the, you know, the kid get pulled out of the room by its foot or whatever, you know. Um, so, you, you know, these things that we were unfamiliar with in, a, in a, a familiar but unfamiliar world is just also kind of crazy. So I like using the depictive uh, aspect in the abstract pieces to relay these kind of connections to whatever's happening to us in the real world. Um, and the other pieces that are straight abstract expressionism, 
you know, I don't pull those images out. I let the piece be the piece, paint be the paint, you know, that whole thing. Um, and and that the silk screen panel, there's one up, the new one, and it's straight abstract expressionism. There's no, I didn't develop those figures. I let them, you know, be dead on the surface and then just kind of went with, uh, you know, the expressionist sort of attitude with it. And it turned out beautiful and it feels really good, but it was a nice break in between pulling all these little detailed images out of each one of these other canvases. So for me, it's a, it's a necessary exercise to kind of have something to step away from one when I'm getting bored or I'm getting to my eyes, I can't see as well, you know, I'm getting older, it's harder to see. And so I have to have some other thing to do. And having these kind of three categories that the collage aspect, actually I have some new collage pieces going, the historical collage pieces um, in my studio now, they're not up for this much show, but they will be soon, but yeah, so. Well, you know, uh, uh, Carter, what occurs, as I'm listening to Margaret talk, we talk about those three categories, you know, that I feel like what she's talking about is pushing boundaries, which is a very common thing with artists. Do you, mm -hmm. Do you, do you find how do boundaries what are boundaries in your mind are they are they are they things to, to hurdle over or butt down or ways to define yourself how, how, how do you think about that i feel like it's a, a, a bit of all of them i think boundaries uh, i think personally boundaries are really created by ourselves majority of the times mm -hmm. i feel like as artists we're we're kind of we're, obligated to take risks and you know break boundaries as artists i feel like you know it's our job to to be vulnerable you know to be vulnerable and take risks and i feel like part of that is breaking boundaries um, well and some of the boundary though and i run into this during the show and other times when i write about artist work you know it's like when you have to put words to it you are automatically it's hard not to have boundaries or classifications or definitions right this is uh -huh. an abstract expressionist painting but you know so i i can look at somebody's work but then there's a figure or there's a thing or there's a space that gets developed and i'm my eye i find is always trying to look at stuff that's purely abstract and find the forms and spaces and things that are suggested by it mm -hmm. so it almost seems like margaret's just like taking that idea and just like pulled it right <laughs> i'm done with all that right i mean that's fine and and that and i and i like that idea with the with like my expressionist or my art my abstract expressionist pieces those are are that way i'll the viewer can stand there all day long and see whatever comes out and what it suggests to them and all that and that's terrific and i love to paint that way i do that's a very free spiritual way of painting for me um, I really don't have to think about it. You know, you just paint as paint kind of thing. But, you know, the, the idea of not developing the things that become so obvious to me while I'm painting the canvas, it became to, uh, an idea in my mind. It's like a crime. I can't not do it. No, I, I want to see who this is. I want to understand this person or this character or this place or this feeling or or whatever it is. So, you know, I just, I decided screw the boundary. I'm going to do what the heck I want. And, and that's exactly what I've done. And, and for me, it's, it's, it feels really good. I like doing it. it and I feel like I am relaying important messages to people. Um, you know, knowing that you only have 36,500 days to love is a really important kind of thing, I think. And uh, if, if I don't, say it then maybe somebody won't know it i don't know i feel like i need to do that i don't know why i'm compelled keith <laughs> well i i think any good artist is compelled you know and people say like why do you do it it's kind of like well you don't necessarily do it for the money i mean if you're lucky you, you, can, you can do well by it but uh, you know the starving artist cliche comes from a reality too 100 uh, percent. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so like the carter like Sitting here, Carter, you seem really young to me, but I, Margaret was telling me you, you've been a working artist for, what, 10 years? Um, a working artist? No, I, don't, I wouldn't say I've been a working artist for 10 years. Let's well, uh, say an artist making work. I'm not, I'm not so concerned. An artist about making about work, yes. How you yes, pay your bills. I've been an artist making work, 
you know, for, I mean, it technically for, for, since I've been a kid, I've always, always been artistic, uh, inclined. It's always invited me in. I've always felt home doing art. Now, did you go to art school or, or anything like that? Uh, no, I was, uh, I went to Ballard high school and I was in the art program there. I was, uh, I bet you had Dennis Whitehouse. I did. I did. I know who that. Yeah, he was my art teacher for a couple of years. He was just on the show last week. Really? Yeah, he's got some look up at Mormon Gallery. He and he taught for CFAC, and I I had lost touch with him now for a while, and he's he's painting. That's funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> what a trip. It's just funny because a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of people will mention if they've had him. He always it always seems like he had a good uh, influence on him. But so you didn't, Absolutely. you didn't go to college and study past that. Mm -mm. So no, would you describe yourself as self taught? I would, I I would say so. Yes. But you like self music too, right? Were you big into me? He's into music, and uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. As, do you as, play? Yeah, as much as uh, I haven't, I haven't played anything like live of course right but yes i do as much as i'm an artist i would say music is art too so i'm also well there's a long history of musicians being artists and artists being musicians and you know going back to you know john lennon was in art school uh-huh absolutely <laughs> Jagger was too you know yeah they go hand in hand <laughs> um do you compose or do you just play music uh i compose and i play but I mainly, yeah, I've, I've been focusing more on both. Does it work different parts of your brain when you're composing a song, or is it the same kind of thing from when you're doing visual art? I I would say it's, it's in a way, it's the same, but it's different. It triggers different things. For me. Um, I feel like music, it's, I feel like music is like, you know, I, I heard one time it said that it's like the, um, it's like the language between worlds, like if you think about it, um, because it it definitely. I mean, anytime you hear a song, you automatically you're you're thinking it. It's your story. Like if you think of it, if you're listening to music, I mean, you're not really thinking of what the musician wrote. You're, I mean, you're putting yourself in in the song. So I feel like I don't know. It brings out a different level of emotion when you when you do music compared to you know visual arts not to say one diminishes the other but have you ever thought about uh or have you ever um put them together in some way like where you maybe have a song and then there's a painting or series of pieces or something that sort of have a relationship that you could present yeah yeah I have, I've, been, I've been thinking about that more and more lately as I, as i've been you know exploring more in painting and in music um like re relating the two you know Mm -hmm. because they're i mean both of them are as an artist they're both my essence so i uh, i mean i feel like you know, i don't see why i wouldn't combine them personally because i know tim faulkner galleries had some outdoor events it seems like when the weather turns warm you know <laughs> right <laughs> there we go carter has to decide he's going to perform though right <laughs> i would love to do that i'd love to do that well he knows he can do it here so uh, we won't make you promise, but uh, we'll be on the lookout for something like that down the line. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, Margaret, let me let me give you the chance uh, because you know you wear so many hats. So I'm going to I'll ask you to wear two hats here today. One as an artist, we've talked about your work, but now talk as a gallery director, talk about Carter's work and what you see in it uh, fr from that perspective of somebody who works with him that way. Well, I you know when I first uh, visited Carter's studio. Uh, I, it was over in Butchertown and as soon as I walked in, I recognized, um, a desire in him to kind of, uh, relay this idea of community in his work, that everything was connected. He had a lot of geometric pieces, um, and both really sharp, hard edge geometric pieces and then a lot of really flowy geometric pieces uh and then i turned around and on the counter in his little kitchenette area was this crazy sculpture that was painted every color that you could even imagine 
it had just wild eyes and a big flappy mouth and a big tall crazy head and i'm like what the heck is this he was like oh that's just one of my sculptures you know i'm like do you have more of these and you know, so i'm like these are fabulous so you know he starts showing me around a little more detail and you know before i even left his studio i had already invited him to start bringing work to the gallery uh and i really think his work lends itself to uh you know a lot of work can get sad you know and morose and even 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 negative sometimes not from him but in general you know especially in the climate of the world and people are expressing all the, the there's a lot of heaviness there and carter's work didn't feel heavy that way carter's work felt very light and kind of refreshing and hopeful and uh and his execution of the pieces uh although some were still kind of rough there was some beautiful work there too. So uh, his first go round when I brought him in, we got a really great response, sold out of all the sculptures we brought in. Uh, and then he's been showing with us pretty regularly now ever since. And then this show today is the first one that we've actually had uh, both painting and sculpture up together in the same main gallery since the initial mm -hmm. time he showed here. Yeah. So um, we're really excited to bring these fun and, you know, happy sort of pieces uh, out into the public again, uh, especially in the month of February. Uh, you know, I'm a sucker for Valentine's Day anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it seemed like the perfect match. So, so I'm really glad to, and he's got another really fun new piece that he uh, did, it's a very geometric piece with a lot of uh, strong color in it, really exploring the entire value system and pinks and, and greens and the way it works together on this long horizontal canvas is really, really nice. So I'm excited for people to see the work. Great. <laughs> but now, he's one of seven artists, I think, in here this yeah, month. Yeah, let's go ahead and take the opportunity. Uh, who else is in, the, both of you, and then who else is in the uh, this exhibit? Um, and then we've got new work from Mark Zani. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Louisville-based artist as well. Uh, we've also got work, uh, new work from Josh Bleeker, who I think you guys, uh, mm -hmm. he had a takeover recently. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have Grant Goodwine, uh, who just brought us new drawings. He works a lot um, in charcoal and acrylic on paper. Uh, and they have a real sort of underworld feeling to them, um, but so much emotion. They're very emotional pieces. And then um, Jess Allen has some new pieces uh, hanging this month. And besides me, and then Chad McConnell has some new work up this month too. And he's got a solo show coming up next month. That's gonna be the first solo show of the new year for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Alex Trainer has some new pieces up too. Okay, cool. Wow, it's a lot to see. Yeah, yeah. No shortage of stuff to see here. That's a lot for sure. of beautiful stuff. There's a <laughs> lot of beautiful stuff here. Well, so Carter, let me ask you when you so when you look around, uh, what, what what would you what would be your comment on some like what's the stuff that really knocks you out? I don't mean for you to like uh, Margaret stuff. Margaret Margaret stuff. Margaret stuff. Yeah, we'll try to <laughs> How do you feel about Margaret stuff? Like what, <laughs> what what's your reaction when you look at Margaret's work, and how would you sort of the way she talked about your work? Take a minute to to to, to put that eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so Margaret's work to me, I mean, I, I'm kind of blown back by it just because, you know, of of how, like, I feel like I step into them when I, when I walk up on them. They're so big and, like, you know, just the palettes that she uses and the way that she paints, like, her brush, her strokes and, and everything about them, that it, it's really just, like, guides your eyes all the way around it. Like, I feel like I just step into them when I'm there. And then the difference between how some of them are like, some of them aren't as like tight and controlled as some of the other ones. Like some of them are more like, you know, I don't know, uh, 
what I would call it. Masterpieces? Is yeah, that the word you call it? Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Some of them are masterpieces. Others are masterpieces. I'm kidding. Yes. I'm kidding. No, no. Yeah. I, uh, but yeah, but some are the more free, the expressionistic yeah, some of them pieces. Are more, yeah, yeah, more free. And yeah. they, they, you can just see that she, it looks like she just threw herself onto the canvas. And I, I love that. Like, that's what I love about it. Well, which one of those three uh, uh, silos that she discussed for her paintings, which one do you respond to the strongest? Um, hmm. and I don't, and I don't mean like there's a qualitative judgment between them, but just like I, I would imagine, you know, art is very reaction to art is very subjective, and different mm -hmm. people respond to things different way. But which, so which one, which part of her work moves you more? Uh, I would say, I don't know. I feel like personally, I've changed a bit more as an artist because I've I've looked more towards like reactionary work too. Um, so I feel like more as recent that more reaction of reactionary work but as as much of the expressionary too like just seeing your expression work I, I don't know it's hard to choose for me because i feel like i kind of lean both ways sometimes like he's sucking up don't don't let him fool you <laughs> well, i was trying to give him that opportunity i know, I know I'm, I'm giving him a hard time it's all right <laughs> Um, well, so let me ask you, let me ask you both this question since, uh, Carter, you've been around for a while and, uh, uh, so let's go back to, let's, let's stay with you, Carter. Uh, so you've been working as an artist for 10 years or, you know, like you say, really all your life, but uh, sort of in the, in the world of it, in terms of galleries and having a studio space for long enough, what, uh, what is, what do you think has changed in that 10 years about the visual arts community in Louisville? In Louisville? Yeah. Um, uh, I feel like a lot of feel like it's blown up, honestly. I mean, as I've grown up too, and, and seen people that I know and friends of mine that have contributed to it, and in the community as a whole, I feel like, you know, just the way the world has gone, we, we've grown a lot artistically. Like, we, we have encouraged expression creativity so much more and I feel like you can see that the way that we live our lives here like I feel like the art community here is definitely it's it's flourishing it's it's flourishing in my eyes I feel like you know uh, do, do, do you feel like you've grown and flourished with it absolutely absolutely and I feel like it's it's inspired me in so many different ways and the more the more I've I've tried to be involved. The more I've, I've made a goal of being involved in the art community and, and in the community in general, I feel like, yeah, it, it's inspired me and helped me flourish in, in many different ways. So Margaret, let's I'll put the same question to you. Uh, and because you've been, I don't know, have you, has it been about 10 years or more? <laughs> Thank you, Kate, for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. As a professional. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I started showing uh, in Louisville in 1997 at Bob Higgins Gallery, at the Anonymous Artist Gallery over there on uh, across from Walden. Um, has it changed over the years? I'd say so, yeah. But how is um, it changed? Like, how would you? Well, I mean, you know, when I, way before there was a Tim Faulkner Gallery and I was showing with Swanson on uh, Chuck Swanson's uh, you know, the Market Street was this little hub and it had all these great little places. You know, Billy Hertz was down there and, you know, there were just a lot of, of activity in one concentrated area. Um, and, and now, not that it's a bad thing, uh, that's really not there anymore. You know, it's more spread out. Um, and I think it's more inviting now than it was back then. Uh, you know, it was really difficult to, you know, you had to put together slides and, you know, you had to submit your slides and you had to do all this stuff to even get your work in a, in a gallery. Um, and, you know, for the past 13 years of Tim Faulkner Gallery that I've been involved, you know, that's never been the case. We've always been super open to people just sharing their work with us and, and, and seeing what we can make work into, in the space and try to give people an opportunity. And it seems to me that a lot of other galleries have kind of done that as well. So it's much easier, I think, for artists to find a home now than it might have been 20 or 30 years ago. 
Um, I think it's not as difficult to do that. And also I think that there's a lot of opportunities for uh, pop-ups and creative spaces that might not have been as readily available years ago either. I think that those opportunities are plentiful now um, and really, and I don't want to sound tough here, but you know, to, uh, the truth is if you're an artist and you're not sh exhibiting somewhere, and I don't mean just in a gallery, I mean in, in a, in a art fair or at a pop-up show or at one of the plethora of other opportunities, well, then you're just not getting out there and doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not doing it, then no one's going to do it for you. Right. So, I mean, it, if you're a young artist and you're, you're just emerging, um, it's really on you to find that, that art fair that you can rent a table at and put your pieces out on, you know, get involved with the LBA and get, get involved in some classes, get, do some figure drawing, do whatever it is. There's lots of opportunity in Louisville that might not have been there when I was a young lass. <laughs> which, which was when you started working for Tim Falk. Right. Um, <laughs> well, no, we, you, but you also said something that I, and I don't, it's not that this is a brand new thing, but uh, you talked about how you visited Carter's studio. And I think the studio yeah. visit for gallery directors, curators, and things like that has become much more important to, mm -hmm. to kind of connect to the artist as opposed to, as you say, an artist coming in with a like, here's me in a portfolio or whatever. But right. To really uh, that to successfully work with develop market art, you need to get to know the artist at, at more more than just like, hey, I can sell those paintings. Exactly. A right. Relationship. And that's been historically the way of uh, I've done it as mm -hmm. the director, the curatorial director for the gallery these last years, that's what I like to do that. I want to come and see your space. I want to see what's inspiring you in your space. I want to see your dog. I want to see your cat. You know, I want to see your environment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really feel like I get to know the artist better when I can see that environment. And it helps me to relay that to the viewer or the guest in the gallery when they come in. I get to talk about the artist a little bit and talk about where they live and what they do and about their practice. And Without that studio visit, I wouldn't have that ability to do that. Carter, when she visited, were you uh, nervous? Were you intimidated? How, how how did it go for you? Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was nervous for for sure. It was like my first time, but at the same time, I was excited. I feel like you know, I, it's more of an excited nervous because, I, and that's true, in the sense that you know, I feel like it makes it more organic when there's a studio visit because it's like are coming into my world you know I'm showing you this is where I create this is where my sanctuary is so I feel like it does bring a more intimate you know that's that's how you want it if you want to show your art at a gallery I feel like you know that that's how you should be set did up you, in. did you clean up your gallery yeah I did I did I, uh, it was so nice uh, I yes. couldn't believe it I was like oh this is a nice place uh, yeah I totally because think I'm of two minds. There's a part of it that says, like, don't clean up your gallery, man. <laughs> like, I want to see how the work happens. Don't do not do too much. You know, like, give me a give me a seat to sit on that I won't get pants, my paint on my pants. But uh, you know, it, I've, I've, I've come to your studio for a reason. Absolutely. I agree with that. I do agree with that, too. <laughs> um, so, uh, Carter, have you shown other places in town? Where else have you been? I, I have. Uh, I've not I did um I did art squared with LBA um, yeah. but other than that no I I've shown here so you're Mark so are you a Margaret Archambault discovery I am I am number one number one fan <laughs> absolutely <laughs> she's thrust me into the spotlight that's my job <laughs> oh, so let's touch on a little bit too, uh, you know, because one of the things when we talk about artists, you know, I was just reading an article in the Leo about black artists and talk about they all have nine to five jobs. And I think, well, artists have nine to five jobs a lot of the times because mm -hmm. it's hard to really make a living off of art entirely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but so, uh, so let, Margaret, let me, let me, let me ask you this question. So mm -hmm. you, know, you, you work real hard for the artists that are in Tim Faulkner. But how how much responsibility 
uh, is there on the 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 act of a, let's say the action of a local gallerist in maybe trying to find connections for that artist in other cities? Because it seems like that's a that's an important way for an artist to develop income is to is to be in more than one marketplace. You know, the, the truth is there's no denying that that that's a fact. Uh, Louisville is definitely a very small market uh, art wise, um, and you know there's only so much to go around. So I have two answers to that question. Number one, I think that if you make art accessible and affordable, then you can broaden your market, which is what we've done at the gallery. I mean, we, we have pieces as low as $50 and we have pieces as expenses as 15,000. So, you know, we're not cutting out any segment of the population here at this particular gallery. Um, and then the second part to that is, yes, I think that reaching out into other markets and, and getting the artists in the Louisville bench, which our bench is actually quite large. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about other cities, I can't really say, but I know that Louisville's bench of artists is deep, talented, uh, diverse, uh, and, and really strong, but getting them into another market is extremely difficult, extremely, especially from the gallery perspective. I mean, myself, I mean, again, I mean, I've been showing for whatever. I don't even want to say it out loud. That makes me feel so old. The numbers are longer than Carter. I'm like, been showing. I've been showing for 30 years, but. Um, I've been showing longer than Carter. Right, just a little <laughs> longer. But even for myself, right, I it has taken until just recently, this past maybe two years, that finally, perseverance has paid off and my work is being shown in places like you know in california and in new york and and it getting out of this you know small market in louisville that's been extremely hard and i mean i'm not going to sugarcoat it i mean it really has been and uh not having a regular nine to five is really difficult to, to you know, live on ramen is, is, is not always the, the greatest thing. Um, but if you can stick to it, if you really believe in what you're creating and you really have a passion to keep doing it until you can't hold a paintbrush in your hand again, then eventually, if you, as the artist, reach out, you're going to find those other markets. You are going to find people that are interested in your work. And that gallery that you're showing at locally, you know, quite frankly, it's not really their job, right? Their job is to support you, to get your, to help you develop your craft and to show your work in, in the gallery that they have, you know, and to promote it through their social media, through whatever it is they have to do the best they can to make you the best you can be. That is their job. It doesn't always include me get, going and researching galleries in across the country to try and find the place for that artist. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an opportunity right there for a job. You know, somebody out there loves art, right? And they have a knowledge of art and they know what they, they're talking about and they like it. Get out there and connect these artists to places that they should be. You know, it could be a really whole new market out there, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> That's an idea. <laughs> well, you know, and I, the reason I ask questions like that is that I always, I always imagine at least part of the audience for the show being people who aren't aware of how the world works for artists. You know, there's, there's, there, the, the worst case scenario example is somebody who just thinks like, ah, you're an artist. You don't really work very hard. Ah, you right. know, right. right. <laughs> Art is very hard work and it's very hard. And a lot of artists have to work at a store or work at a warehouse or do something, you know, and if you're lucky, maybe you find a place that, that you do something sort of creative or maybe right. you teach, you know, right. it's very hard. But, you know, th so I this kind of stuff is very interesting. Uh, it's not easy and it takes more, you know, each individual artist needs support from a variety of different directions. Yes, I would a good, agree with that. Good gallerist family, friends, you know, just all yeah. sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. a, it's always one of the themes I have, a, a recurrent themes, is that uh, almost every conversation is about the work of artists, of mm -hmm. making art. 
and and doing all that. So yeah, if you're if you're you know yeah. soft at heart, this is not the job for you. I no. mean, I mean, you really <laughs> got to be willing to struggle. I mean, there it's a struggle. It's suck. There's some suffering involved, and you know you've got to really be passionate about it. And you know. And and the the of course the irony is that the p- people that are soft of heart are often people who want to create. I know, <laughs> I know. Want to make and, art. And, mm-hmm. Which is, and and which is you know such a paradox, right? But you know, it, ultimately, if you if you can harden it up just enough, you can still create and make it through. Uh, you know the, the out, you know the comparison we always make is it's the difference between the sea or the river. You know, on in the river, you can go down the river, you can do the thing that's comfortable and safe and you get your that weekly paycheck and you keep creating the whatever it is you're into pay, you paint plants, I don't know, whatever it is you paint, you keep painting your plants and you get your check every week, right? Or you jump in the boat and you get out in the sea and you say, screw it. And the next thing you know, you're painting you know, redwoods or you're painting whatever the next thing up from plants would be. I don't know. <laughs> you know that you're, you're expanding your repertoire, but you're in this rough ocean, this sea where it's just not easy. It's hard. It's, you're going to get knocked around. You're going to, that you're going to fail. You're going to lose the anchor every once in a while. You know, you're going to get holes in your sails. You're going to, all these things are going to happen. But eventually if you cross that ocean, there is land ahead you know, land ahoy or whatever. I mean, it is there. You just have to be willing to fight the waves and the turbulence, you know, along the way. Well, and I think uh, on that tidal wave of nautical metaphors from (laughs) Margaret, I think we'll we'll, we'll wrap things up here. That was, uh, that was great, full of passion. Uh, So uh, we've been talking to Margaret Archambault and Carter Brown, both abstract expressionist painters sort of but much let's say they are but they're also much more than that how about that yes uh, but their work is their work is on exhibit now at tim faulkner gallery um um opening february 4th is that friday yeah mm-hmm. february 4th and running through through the rest of the month um yep. So uh, if 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 what you heard here is at all intriguing to you, <laughs> go. Um, don't just look at websites. Always go and be in person. And if you're worried about Omicron, and I, I preach this, I say that almost every time. I think going to a gallery now, an opening is a maybe, but going to a gallery with a friend and or who, maybe whoever you live with is one of the safest cultural experiences. A hundred percent. You can't, t- you're not allowed to touch anything. I mean, Wear a mask, you're not allowed to touch anything. <laughs> Come see some art. Go with whoever you're in your bubble with. <laughs> you don't have to deny yourself is the point. You can have, um, you can have a, a, a wonderful experience inside of a gallery. So, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Key. Margaret Archambault, Carter Brown, uh, thank you so much for talking to me. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.